سلام نام من نرگس است نام فامیل من فرزد است من در سوانس دانشگاه لندن فارسی درس می دهم Hello My name is Nargis Farzad and I teach Persian language and literature mostly poetic literature at Soaz University of London I would like to take you on a journey with me I hope it will be a little bit of an adventure as well I would like to introduce you to the Persian language and tell you a little bit about its development Persian Persian's origins go back several millennia and we normally divide this continuum into three periods old persian or old iranian middle persian and new or modern persian new persian really refers to the persian that was started to be written in the perso arabic script after the arrival of islam in Iran. In a moment, I'll also show you a PowerPoint, some images that hopefully will put all that I'm saying into a more visual context. But first, a little bit about the place of Persian amongst the languages of the world and its place in the heart of Europeans. Westerners have always had a very soft spot not just for Persian language and poetry, but for many things Persians, for its arts, for architecture, and for its gardens. After all, the word paradise comes from the Persian word pardis, those heavenly gardens created on earth, which hopefully will also be our eternal resting places. In June, 1853, Frederick Engels, who was living in Manchester at the time and who was also a prolific writer, wrote a letter to his friend Karl Marx, who was living in London. And he, Frederick, tells Marx that he has just started learning Persian. He says that for the purpose he has been using a grammar book that was written by the 18th century judge and philologist Sir William Jones. Frederick Engels concludes that in comparison to several languages that he had attempted to learn, Persian is really a child's play and he tells Marx that he hopes to learn the Persian grammar in 48 hours. However, he does admit that coming to grips with learning the Perso-Arabic script is a lot more challenging. And he says that had it not been for this fairly complex script, Persian would indeed be an ideal candidate for a universal language. And there it is already made. I mentioned uh, the 18th century William Jones. He was indeed a linguistic genius. And by the end of his life, he knew eight lang languages very well. He could use them for academic purposes, you know, including Greek, Latin, Hebrew, French, etc., and of course Persian. And he knew another 15 or so languages that he could function in and with the aid of dictionaries you could really get by using materials written in those languages. He reminds me actually of the first director of our university SOAS, uh, Sir Edward Denison Ross, Professor Ross, who was uh, the director of SOAS from 1916 to 1937 and a polyglot himself. He actually was a scholar of Persian language and literature and used to teach Persian at SOAS when he was the director. 
where was I? I'm sorry, I do tend to go off on uh, many tangents, but I hope you stay with me. I was talking about Sir William Jones. He is um, associated with the term Indo-European languages. This is a, a title that he chose for a huge number of European languages and languages particularly in the northern parts of the Indian subcontinent that seem to have a lot in common. This means that Persian and Hindi and English and German and so on have a lot in common in terms of grammar, in terms of vocabulary, nouns, words that you might recognize. But of course, they may not be immediately obvious when you listen to a Persian speaker or a German speaker, you may not identify all these common denominators, but with a little bit of detective work and a little bit of going deeper into their pronunciations or their place in the sentence, for example, you will soon see that we do have a lot in common. Now, I think it's time to start our visual journey and for me to illustrate the uh, similarities between all these languages. So I'm going to share um, my screen with you. I'm going to show you, start showing you a PowerPoint. I'm going to take you back to five 53 BC. I'm going to take you to this beautiful setting where the court of the Achaemenid Empire resided. This is the ceremonial palace of the Achaemenids. It um, is situated about um, 60, 70 kilometers to the northeast of the magnificent city of Shiraz in Iran. And um, uh, as I mentioned, the ceremonial palace of this mighty empire. You will perhaps heard names such as Xerxes, Darius, Cyrus, and so on. These names are very popular boys' names, such as Kurosh, Cyrus, Darius, and so on. And uh, several of these names, particularly the name of uh, Xerxes, appear in the Bible in the book of Esther. This ceremonial palace uh, was known as Parsa to the Persians, and the Greeks refer to it as Persepolis, <clears throat> which is still the name that Europeans use for it. In modern Persian, we recall it Tahte Jamshid, the throne of Jamshid. The empire of Achaemenes was the largest empire of the ancient world. And I've chosen one of the many uh, reliefs on this, on the remains of this monument, <clears throat> to show you so many features that are associated with the passionate culture, bringing gifts, love of beautiful ornaments, love of uh, celebrations and food and culinary culture and animals, and of course, all the ceremonial dress and all the attributes of a mighty court. I've, um, here is the iconic images of especially the lion, which has a very uh, prominent place in Persianate culture. And I wanted to draw your attention to these other images. These are maybe the representatives, ambassadors, princes of many vassal states coming up for a ceremony, bringing gifts. And here are uh, the image of them all holding hands mostly to demonstrate the peace and um, mutual respect that ruled over this empire. Here is a map that shows the expanse of this world at its largest. Um, it uh, covers 
huge parts of the Indian subcontinent, Central Asia, of course, modern day Iran, bits of the Caucasus, um, bits of Mesopotamia, chunks of Anatolia, and North Africa. Uh, you can imagine how multilingual and multicultural such a vast empire would have been. But the languages of officialdom, officialdom were um, uh, Old Iranian, Old Persian, uh, which was written in cuneiform, uh, similarly to other ancient Near Eastern languages like Akkadian, for example the language of the Babylonians. But uh, Iranians used uh, Greek for inscriptions on their coinage. Uh, the Cyrus Cylinder had a very popular visit to Iran over 10 years ago. The object is um, currently at the British Museum. So it went to Iran um, in 2010 and was there for several months with queues of people coming to see it. And then it also had a very successful tour of several United States um, states and museums about 2013, if I'm not uh, wrong. Uh, Cyrus Cylinder is often referred to as the first charter of human rights because the inscription on it, written in Akkadian, um, refers to the necessity of allowing the citizens to exercise freedom of religion, freedom of speaking in the language that they are associated with, and uh, generally having respect for multi-faith, multicultural societies. This period is also associated with the Greco-Persian wars, the rivalry with the, between the two mighty empires, the Persians and the Greeks and the downfall of the Achaemenids is um, uh, uh, associated with the arrival of Alexander not so great, if you don't mind me not calling him Alexander the Great, but call him Alexander the Macedonian, who invaded, conquered Iran, and um, also, it is alleged, set fire to the Persepolis, which was destroyed very rapidly due to all the textiles, all the timber, and so on that was used in that palace. The uh, language, as I told you, was the cuneiform, and here is an example of it. Many examples can be found in museums around the world, and of course, on the monuments and rock reliefs in the region. The coinage uh, was a very important part of the might of the uh, ruler. And as I said, the inscriptions are often in the Greek language. And uh, there are many examples of these coins at museums all over the world. The next prominent rulers who arrived uh, on the scene were the Parthians, the magnificent dynamic Parthians, who ruled over a vast region, albeit, as you see from the map, a more uh, shrunken empire compared to the Achaemenids. And they ruled over uh, Iran from uh, 247 BC to 224 AD which is almost 500 years. Uh, the Parthians were great horsemen, great champions of the arts, and uh, also, uh, as you can see, they were snazzy dressers. And it's thanks to them that the tunic-trouser combination is the staple of many a wardrobe. Uh, with the Parthians, um, uh, we move more towards the emergence of Middle Persian as the language of the empire. To begin with, uh, Greek, Imperial Aramaic, and Hebrew, and so on, um, were more used. And as you see in the uh, coinage, gradually Mid Middle Persian emerges, but 
the inscriptions again are in uh, Greek. There are very significant um, images on this coinage, but perhaps discussion of them can wait for another time. Parthians loved beautiful objects and uh, their love of ceremony is very prominent in this um, you know, archaeological material that again are displayed all over the world in museums. This is a drinking cup, a drinking vessel and um, it goes back it, uh, to the, the construction of it, it goes back to the Achaemenid period, but it was uh, produced and reproduced throughout the ages. Parthians also had the language, you know, part Parthian Persian, but that language is extinct. The Parthian rule ended in 224 when Ardeshir, the first already ruler of a region, revolted against the Parthian kings and brought down the empire and established his own dynasty of the Sasanians, the house of Sasan. They're often referred to as the Neo-Persian Empire. And their end came with the arrival of the Arab Muslims in Iran in 651 AD. Again, you see from the map that here, the uh, immediate enemies, rivals, are not the Greeks, but the Romans. And here are the rule of the Romans on the eastern edges of the empire. The language of the Sasanians is the uh, um, Middle Persian and um, is written in the Pahlavi script. This is a very famous um, rock relief near uh, Naqshirustam, and you will see Shahpur, uh, the mighty finder of dynasty, and he is um, uh, looking at the Emperor Valerian, who is kneeling beside Shahpur's horse. And um, Valerian is really the first uh, Roman emperor who was held captive, who was imprisoned. And this really sent shudders down the spine of the Roman military and administrators and really shook that empire. Uh, Sasanian, again, here there's another image, you will see the headwear is changed and there is a relationship between church and state. Here is the king receiving, here's the king on the left, receiving a diadem, if you like, a mandate from the representative of the divine to rule on his behalf. Here are examples of the Pahlavi script, and you can see it's becoming much more sort of, you know, curly-whirly, and it does look also not dissimilar to Syriac or in a Royal Aramaic. And uh, more coinage from this period. And you can now see that the inscription is in Middle Persian. It's very important to note that there were several other languages that already had a script at this time and people who lived um, uh, in, the, in, in Iran of the time. And one crucial language is um, Hebrew. And there were many, many uh, Jewish Persians who didn't really feel the necessity to learn the Arabic script and adapt it to, you know, Persian for their use. They already had the Hebrew script. So they've created this huge body of work known as the Judeo-Persian literature and manuscripts, um, whose production continues to really, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, classical period to 14th, 15th century. And here are some examples of Judeo-Persian texts. I think this is a good place to pause and take a break. In the next episode, I'll fast forward to the era of new Persian, and we can take the first steps 
to learning some Persian Farsi. Fe'lan khoda negahdar. Bye for now.